everyone, I am Carrie Biscalonis with Reset Brain and Body here with you today for this mental health series with Detroit Moms. So today I want to talk about what it's like to go to therapy. Some of you may be therapy veterans, whereas a lot of you might be people that have kind of entertained the idea of going to therapy but never have actually fallen through. Or perhaps you're someone that have heard horrible stories of what therapy is like or have seen it depicted in movies or TV shows and say, uh-uh, not me. I don't want to experience that. So I know for me, back in the day when I thought about what therapy was, you know, when I heard about people going to therapy in high school, I, for one, thought that it was me lying on a couch and someone across from me with a notepad taking notes the whole time. Well, maybe. That's something that you would experience with certain therapists, but for the most part, that depiction is not accurate, at least anymore. The thing with therapy is that we are seeing a huge shift in the field. Gone are the traditional, more archaic modes of someone sitting there offering not a lot of engagement other than asking you repeatedly, and how does this make you feel? Nowadays, because more and more millennials are getting into this work, it's a little bit more uh, direct. There's a little bit more challenging that's happening. It feels somewhat like life coaching with that accountability and homework and goal setting, but at the same time, that clinical focus of, okay, I am here, I'm creating a safe space for you, and we're gonna dig deep into stuff that might be holding you back continuously. So. Let's back up and start from the very beginning. First, how do you even find a therapist? Psychology Today is a directory online that you can utilize. Also a more inclusive type of resource is something like Therapy Done. But I would say the best place is to get a recommendation from someone that you know and trust. So that could be someone that you know sees a therapist, your doctor, um, a family member, or searching Instagram or Facebook and seeing what your friends like or engage with and think, okay, that, that feels like someone that I could feel safe with and be vulnerable with. From there, typically you're gonna have some type of initial consultation and think of this like dating in that you are trying to get a good feel for the therapist and see if this person is a good fit for you because not every therapist will be a good fit for you and that is okay. Just like not every person you date is going to be a good fit for you. If you are expected to share your soul with someone, <laughs> you obviously aren't just going to go with the first person that you meet. You're going to want to vet them and you're going to want to ask questions. Some of those questions might be like, how often do you recommend that someone comes in? Do you take insurance or not? If not, what is the pay rate that you're expecting? Do you offer sliding scale? Sliding scale is something that a lot of therapists do put in place for those that financially are not able to afford the full fee of the therapy session. Now, some therapists accept insurance, some therapists don't. The reason for that difference is usually because certain insurances reimburse therapists at a rate that feels commensurate to their experience or it doesn't. And that is up to the individual therapist and the insurance panel. But that's why you sometimes see therapists accepting a ton of insurances and therapists not. It's because insurance companies do not pay the same rate across the board. Insurance companies all pay something a little bit different. And depending on how much overhead or education that you have as a therapist, then you're going to want to work with an insurance panel that pays you a fee that feels, again, commiserate to your own experience and your own investment in yourself. Okay, so those are a couple logistical questions. You're also gonna ask, are you seeing clients in person or are you seeing them virtually only? Do you offer flexibility? What is your cancellation policy? What type of arrangement do you have as far as communication? Can I text, can I email, can I call you? How do you do billing? How often am I charged? <laughs> Again, some more of those logistical questions. You're also gonna to wanna to ask them things like, you know, do you have a specific way in which you work with clients? And what I have found in my experience, you're gonna to wanna to work with someone that is most open-minded and says, you know what, I wanna work with a client and really let them identify how the relationship's gonna go. And this is called person-centered counseling in which you really 
work on developing that rapport with the therapist and the therapist doesn't particularly look at you just through one specific lens that they learned in school, but rather get to know you as an individual, get to know your goals, get to know your story, and then identify as a way forward from there. Now, there are therapists like the ones here at Reset that then take it a step further and say, we also integrate different modalities to help you get to the care and the treatment that you're looking for. Things like meditation, mindfulness, yoga, creative expression, like art, play, or music therapy. And that might be something that's interested, interesting to you or something that isn't interesting to you. You may want to work with a private practice that you know offers a little bit more freedom in how therapists do things, or you're going to want to work with more of a clinical setting, maybe in a hospital or an agency. These are all things that you are allowed to ask about and use to vet your decision with working with a therapist. Now, usually the first session, it is a complete data dump <laughs> in that you as the client walks in and just has to share your story or at least give a little bit of background information. What are you looking to achieve? What are you hoping to work on? And it's okay if you're not in crisis. And this is one of the biggest misconceptions of therapy is that we think that we have to go in with some sort of huge crisis or some sort of huge question, and that's just not the case. Now, if a therapist does take insurance, they will have to diagnose you. And this is something where the therapist will have to do a little bit of digging to identify what that diagnosis is so that they can submit your claims. And if this is something that intimidates you or feels kind of like, oh, I don't want to have a diagnosis, you can always say, you know what, even though you might take my insurance, I want to pay out of pocket because I don't want a diagnosis at this time. But if you are using insurance, it's important that you recognize that your therapist will have to make a diagnosis. Now, a lot of people struggle with depression, anxiety, or in therapy, we call it adjustment disorder. Right now, under COVID times, most people are suffering with an adjustment disorder in that these are unprecedented times and we're all adjusting and there's stress and anxiety and depression and diminished functioning of our full capacity going on right now. But again, don't be too intimidated by this process, but the therapist is going to have to ask you some questions in order to get that diagnosis if you're using your insurance. Okay, so they will, again, ask you some overarching questions, maybe family history, maybe you fill this form out online before your appointment, or it's something that you do in session, that first session. But again, it's going to be kind of a data dump. But don't think that you have to go in and because you know what your diagnosis is and that you're going to be diagnosed because again you could go in and say i need to explore we need to learn more about each other the therapist doesn't have to make that diagnosis right away either so again i want to go back to this point of you don't have to be in crisis to ask for help because this might be the biggest barrier to entry and that we think that again something huge has to be going on in our life when in reality we could be feeling stuck or we don't actually have the language or the tools to self-assess and say oh my gosh this is anxiety or wow my anger and my irritability is actually depression sometimes that label helps us sometimes it doesn't but either way, we might be diminishing our, mo our own experience by delaying ourselves going to ask for help and getting therapy. Because we might realize, oh my gosh, I've been struggling with an eating disorder my whole life. Maybe I don't look anorexic, but I have these food avoidance and restrictive tendencies that I've had for 20 plus years. Or maybe we have rationalized and thought that our anxiety and our worry and our fear and those thoughts that come in that are so scary are normal when in reality we have generalized anxiety. Or we recognize that all those times when we've said no to social obligations and we've been so indifferent to life and feeling hopeless and cynical and irritable and just withdrawn isn't just hormonal, isn't just laziness, isn't just being burned out, it's actually depression that comes and goes. So it's helpful when we start going to therapy to say, huh, okay, my experience can now be validated. Okay, so beyond that initial session then, what can you expect going forward? So I love this quote from Brene Brown that basically sums up, I think, the perfect experience of therapy. So she says, if we can share our story with someone who responds with empathy and understanding, shame cannot survive. Again, if we can share our story with someone who responds with empathy and understanding, shame cannot survive. The beauty of working with a therapist is that this person is non-judgmental and they are unbiased. 
They come as a subjective third party. They don't know your full story. They don't know your mom or dad or your spouse. They aren't going to see you most likely on the street to see you with your kids. This is an objective third party. And if we can be honest with this person and we can truly be honest with ourselves and sharing our truth, being vulnerable and recognizing that the therapist's job is there to be empathetic and understanding, shame cannot survive. And why I think this is so important is that I believe that underneath most of our behaviors and our thoughts, there's a shame story. There's something with a limited belief or a message we've told ourselves. There's self-criticism that has driven our behavior and our thoughts. And when we're able to get that empathy and understanding, when we shed light on that darkness, on that story that we've hidden for so long, shame cannot survive. We start the process of healing. And what does that look like? Oh, it is not linear. Therapy is not like, I just keep going, 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 and then I get an A and I graduate. There's a lot of jokes out there I know on podcasts and stuff about graduating from therapy. I call it maintenance mode. I don't think you ever graduate. <laughs> I think you get to a point where you no longer need the weekly or biweekly support, but having that regular monthly check-in is so important to continuing to stay self-aware and accountable because therapy truly is the process of peeling back the layers to recognize why do I do that? Why do I keep having issues with that? Why does this keep coming up for me? And how do I finally let go and move on? How do I become the best version of myself? And a lot of times that starts not with implementing a diet and workout routine, but by getting to know our stuff, the stuff that we've buried, the stuff that's uncomfortable, the stuff we've avoided. And we have to look at that with support and understanding because going through that process alone is not fun. <laughs> So if a therapist can be there to help guide you through the process of, again, peeling back the layers, getting a little bit messy, rumbling in our story, then we're going to be able to rebuild our story to then empower ourselves, to feel more confident, to feel more at peace, to feel more joy, to feel a little bit more in control of our emotions. It's not a linear process. There is no A in therapy. It just asks that you show up, be vulnerable be open and be okay to change. Because ultimately that's what we're lo looking towards is okay, how can I be a little bit better version of myself? Not that I have to be a different person, but just a better version of who I already am. Because here's the thing, life has layered all of this stuff on us that took us away from our default state of being. And that default state of mind is happiness, it's contentment. But the stories, experiences, traumas, memories, culture, society, everything piles on that we lose who we innately are. So it's not about becoming a different version of yourself. It's just peeling back the layers, freeing yourself from all that stuff, decluttering your mind, decluttering your body so that you can rise up once again and be who you were meant to be. And that in itself shows up in the world as someone who is more confident and happy and joyful and wants to be around other people and other people want to be around as well. Someone who wants to take care of themselves, who doesn't self-sabotage, who isn't so hard on herself. Okay, so lastly, I want to end this with, <coughs> excuse me, dry throat, the fact that it is never too late to start therapy. And I find that anytime I see a 12, 13, 14, 15 year old sitting across from me in therapy, I say, gosh, are you lucky? You are so lucky to start this process so young. What a gift that you're starting to find the mechanisms for self-awareness now. So that when you're 50, 60, 70, you're not looking back and saying, what the heck? What were those choices that I made? Life did not, was not supposed to look like this. The amount of times that I've seen someone come in at 50, it seems to be a really pivotal Pivotal age, 50, they come in and say, life is not what I thought it was going to look like at this age. And they have two choices. They either, either decide that they're just going to live to start dying, start that long road to death, or they say, I need, to, I need to figure things out. I need to shift. I need to figure out how I got to this point so I don't repeat it for the next 30, 40, 50 years. You are never too late. It is never too late. There is always time to shift things. Okay, I am happy to, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, 
to continue this discussion at any point, I'm going to drop a link to a podcast series that we did that explains a little bit more about the process, what to expect, um, and specifically here at Reset too, giving you a little bit more insight into our process. And again, not all therapists are the same, but if you're curious more about what Reset does and the way in which we work with clients, I'll drop that podcast link so you can give it a listen. But please, any other questions, comments, concerns, hesitations, please drop in the comments and I will reply. Have a great day. Thank you.